on YouTube and Facebook. On the 16th of October, I recommenced my excavations in the valley of Beban El Maluk and pointed, but the fortunate spot, which has paid me for all the trouble I took in my researches. I may call this a fortunate day, one of the best perhaps of my life. I do not mean to say, that fortune has made me rich, for I do not consider all rich men fortunate, but she has given me that satisfaction that extreme pleasure, which wealth cannot purchase, the pleasure of discovering what has been long sought in vain, and of presenting the world with a new and perfect monument of Egyptian antiquity, which can be recorded as superior to any other in point of grandeur, style, and preservation. Appearing as if just finished on the day we entered it, and what I found in it will show its great superiority to all others. Not fifteen yards from the last tomb I described, I caused the earth to be opened at the foot of a steep hill, and under a torrent, which, when it rains, pours a great quantity of water over the very spot I have caused to be dug. No one could imagine, that the ancient Egyptians would make the entrance into such an immense and superb excavation just under a torrent of water, but I had strong reasons to suppose, that there was a tomb in that place, from indications I had observed in my pursuit. The fellows who were accustomed to digging were all of opinion, that there was nothing in that spot, as the situation of this tomb differed from that of any other. I continued the work however, and the next day, the 17th, in the evening, we perceived the part of the rock that was cut, and formed the entrance. On the 18th, Early in the morning, the task was resumed, and about noon the workmen reached the entrance, which was 18 feet below the surface of the ground. The appearance indicated, that the tomb was of the first rate, but still, I did not expect to find such a one as it proved to be. The fellows advanced till they saw that it was probably a large tomb, when they protested they could go no further, the tomb was so much choked up with large stones, which they could not get out of the passage. I descended, examined the place, pointed out to them where they might dig, and in an hour there was room enough for me to enter through a passage that the earth had left under the ceiling of the first corridor, which is 36 foot 2 inches long, and 8 foot 8 inches wide, and, when cleared of the ruins, 6 foot 9 inches high. I perceived immediately by the painting on the ceiling, and by the hieroglyphics in basso relievo, which were to be seen where the earth did not reach, that this was the entrance into a large and magnificent tomb. At the end of this corridor I came to a staircase 23 foot long, and of the same breadth as the corridor. The door at the bottom is 12 foot high. From the foot of the staircase, I entered another corridor, 37 foot 3 inches long, and of the same width and height as the other, each side sculptured with hieroglyphics in basso relievo, and painted. The ceiling also is finely painted, and in pretty good preservation. The more I saw, the more I was eager to see, such being the nature of man, but I was checked in my anxiety at this time, for at the end of this passage I reached a large pit, which intercepted my progress. This pit is 30 foot deep, and 14 foot by 12 foot 3 inches wide. The upper part of the pit is adorned with figures, from the wall of the passage up to the ceiling. The passages from the entrance to this pit incline downward of an angle of 18 degrees. On the opposite side of the pit facing the entrance, I perceived a small aperture 2 foot wide and 2 foot 6 inches high, and at the bottom of the wall a quantity of rubbish. A rope fastened to a piece of wood, that was laid across the passage against the projections which formed a kind of door, appears to have been used by the ancients for descending into the pit, 
and from the small aperture oil, the opposite side hung another, which reached the bottom, no doubt to ascend. We could perceive, that the water which entered the passages from the torrents of rain ran into this pit, and the wood and rope fastened to it crumbled to dust on touching them. At the bottom of the pit were several pieces of wood, placed against the side of it, to assist the person who was to ascend by the rope into the aperture. I saw the impossibility of proceeding at the moment. Mr. Beachy, whom that day, came from Luxor, Luxor, entered the tomb but was also disappointed. The next day, the 19th, by means of a long beam we succeeded in sending a man up into the aperture, and having contrived to make a bridge of two beams, we crossed the pit. The little aperture we found to be autolyzing forced through a wall, that had entirely closed the entrance, which was as large as the corridor. The Egyptians had closely shut it up, plastered the wall over, and painted it like the rest of the sides of the pit, so that but for the aperture, it would have been impossible to suppose, that there was any further proceeding, and anyone would conclude, that the tomb ended with the pit. The rope in the inside of the wall did not fall to dust, but remained pretty strong, the water not having reached it at all, and the wood to which it was attached was in good preservation. It was owing to this method of keeping the damp out of the inner parts of the tomb that they are so well preserved, and observed some cavities at the bottom of the well, but found nothing in them, nor any communication from the bottom to any other place, therefore we could not doubt their being made to receive the waters from the rain, with which happens occasionally in this mountain. The valley is so much raised by the rubbish, which the water carries down from the upper path there that the entrance into these tombs has become much lower than the torrents, in consequence, the water finds its way into the tombs, some of which are entirely choked up with earth. When we had passed through the little aperture we found ourselves in a beautiful hall, 27 feet 6 inches by 25 feet 10 inches, in which were four pillars 3 feet square. I shall not give any description of the painting, until I have described the whole of the chambers. At the end of this room, which I call the entrance hall, and opposite the aperture, is a large door, from which three steps lead down into a chamber with two pillars. This is 28 feet 2 inches by 25 feet 6 inches. The pillars are 3 feet 10 inches square. I gave it the name of the drawing room, for it is covered with figures, which though only outlined, are so fine and perfect, that you would think they had been drawn only the day before. Returning into the entrance hall, we saw on the left of the aperture a large staircase, which descended into a corridor. It is 13 feet 4 inches long, 7 feet 6 inches wide, and has 18 steps. At the bottom we entered a beautiful corridor, 36 feet 6 inches by 6 feet 11 inches. We perceived that the paintings became more perfect as we advanced farther into the interior. They retained their gloss, or a kind of varnish over the colors, which had a beautiful effect. The figures are painted on a white ground. At the end of this corridor we descended 10 steps, which I call the small stairs, into another, 17 feet 2 inches by 10 feet 5 inches. From this, we entered a small chamber, 20 feet 4 inches by 13 feet 8 inches, to which I gave the name of the Room of Beauties, for it is adorned with the most beautiful figures in basso relievo, like all the rest, and painted. When standing in the center of this chamber, the traveler is surrounded by an assembly of Egyptian gods and goddesses. Proceeding farther, we entered a large hall, 27 feet 9 inches by 26 feet 10 inches. In this hall are two rows of square pillars, three on each side of the entrance, forming a line with the corridors. At each side of this hall is a small chamber, that on the right is 10 feet 5 inches by 8 feet 8 inches, that on the left 10 feet 5 inches by 8 feet 9 and 1 half inches. This hall I termed the Hall of Pillars, the little room on the right, 
Isis room, as in it a large cow is painted, of which I shall give a description hereafter, that on the left, the room of mysteries, from the mysterious figures it exhibits. At the end of this hall we entered a large saloon, with an arched roof or ceiling, which is separated from the hall of pillars only by a step so that the two may be reckoned one. The saloon is 31 feet 10 inches by 27 feet. On the right is a small chamber without anything in it, roughly cut, as if unfinished, and without painting. On the left we entered a chamber with two square pillars, 25 feet 8 inches by 22 feet 10 inches. This I called the sideboard room, as it has a projection of 3 feet in the form of a sideboard all round, which was perhaps intended to contain the articles necessary for the funeral ceremony. The pillars are 3 feet 4 inches square, and the whole beautifully painted as the rest. At the same end of the room, and facing the hall of pillars, we entered by a large door into another chamber with four pillars, one of which is fallen down. This chamber is 43 feet 4 inches by 17 feet 6 inches. The pillars 3 feet 7 inches square. It is covered with white plaster, where the rock did not cut smoothly, but there is no painting on it. The bull's, or apis room, as we found the carcass of a bull in it, embalmed with asphaltum, and also, scattered in various places, and an immense quantity, of small. Wooden figures of mummies 6 or 8 inches long, and covered with asphaltum to preserve them. There were some other figures of fine earth baked, colored blue, and strongly varnished. On each side of the two little rooms were wooden statues standing erect, four feet high, with a circular hollow inside, as if to contain a roll of papyrus, which I have no doubt they did. We found likewise fragments of other statues of wood and composition. But the description of what we found in the center of the saloon, and which I have reserved till this place, merits the most particular attention, not having its equal in the world, and being such as we had no idea could exist. It is a sarcophagus of the finest oriental alabaster, 9 feet 5 inches long, and 3 feet 7 inches wide. Its thickness is only 2 inches, and it is transparent when a light is placed in the inside of it. It is minutely sculptured within and without with several hundred figures, which do not exceed two inches in height, and represent, as I suppose, the whole of the funeral procession and ceremonies relating to the deceased, united with several emblems. I cannot give an adequate idea of this beautiful and invaluable piece of antiquity, and can only say, that nothing has been brought into Europe from Egypt that can be compared with it. The cover was not there. It had been taken out, and broken into several pieces, which we found in digging before the first entrance. The sarcophagus was over a staircase in the center of the saloon, which communicated with a subterraneous passage, leading downwards, 300 feet in length. At the end of this passage, we found a great quantity of bats dung, which choked it up, so that we could go no farther without digging. It was nearly filled up too by the falling in of the upper part. One hundred feet from the entrance is a staircase in good preservation, but the rock below changes its substance from a beautiful solid calcareous stone, becoming a kind of black rotten slate, which crumbles into dust only by touching. This subterraneous passage proceeds in a southwest direction through the mountain. I measured the distance from the entrance, and also the rocks above, and found that the passage reaches nearly halfway through the mountain to the upper part of the valley. I have reasons to suppose that this passage was used to come into the tomb by another entrance, but this could not be after the death of the person who was buried there, for at the bottom of the stairs just tinder the sarcophagus a wall was built, which entirely closed the communication between the tomb and the subterraneous passage. Some large blocks of stone were placed under the sarcophagus horizontally, level with the pavement of the saloon, that no one might perceive any stairs or subterranean passage was there. 
The doorway of the sideboard room had been walled up, and forced open, as we found the stones with which it was shut, and the mortar and the jams. The staircase of the entrance hall had been walled up also at the bottom, and the space filled, with rubbish, and the floor covered with large blocks of stone, to deceive anyone who should force the fallen wall near the pit, and make him suppose, that the tomb ended with the entrance hall, and the drawing room. I am inclined to believe, that whoever forced all these passages must have had some spies with them, who were well acquainted with the tomb throughout. The tomb faces the northeast, and the direction of the hole runs straight southwest.